Please welcome to the microphone, Steve Keen. Thank you. Well, I would say, must say I was also delighted to see uh, the, the way in which Aaron organised the conference, and I checked on some of his previous work as well, and I thought this is definitely a community conference worth coming to. And certainly his presentation a moment ago, you, I, I'm glad to see activists getting involved who don't think they've got a complete answer, because that's one of the most dangerous things. You get zealots in control rather than people who can learn from experience, and we definitely need that after what we've been through. So I'll be talking about credit money, how it works and why it fails. I'm not somebody who believes it has to fail, but I certainly believe the empirical record that it almost always has. And I want to put an explanation together to explain the two. Now, if you look at the conventional economic theory, is dominated by a group who are called, they, they, they call themselves Keynesian economists. They know about as much about Keynes as I know about, uh, well, uh, let's see, <laughs> Moses, I suppose, will do. Um, <laughs> I've probably read more Moses than they've read Keynes. And uh, suppose they were concerned, they, we call them neoclassical, that's a more accurate term of where they come from, the neoclassical school of thought. And so far as they thought, up to and including 2008, we're in the living the best of all possible worlds. You notice the name at the end there, Ben Bernanke, uh, was one of many who popularised the term of the great moderation to describe what they saw was happening. What they were perceiving was this. Over a, about a 20 or 30 year time period, say 30 years ago to, to now, you had declining unemployment and declining inflation. And of course, they were patting themselves on the back and congratulating themselves for being the reason why that was happening. Most of the uh, great moderation literature, which Ben definitely promoted, was saying it was because due to good monetary management we got to that situation. Well, that was then. And all of a sudden, what they'd prefer to call a black swan hit in 2008, and unemployment and, sh and inflation went in opposite directions. Unemployment soared to 10% and above if you take a look at the U6 rate, which is more... Uh, more honest and more comparable to the Great Depression level, and de de inflation of 5% turned into deflation. And so far as they were concerned that uh, yeah, this was a, a black swan event, to, to take the term again from a book most of them haven't read uh, by Ted and Nassim Tlaib about unexpected events and complexity, uh, they said no, nobody could possibly have seen this coming. The basic excuse, and our, our, our Reserve Gov Bank Governor himself made precisely that statement, he knew of no one who predicted this course of events. This is about a year and a half after I've been on national television a million times. <laughs> so nobody could have seen it coming. And the same thing was said to the Queen. I found this quite delightful. I wish I could do her accent. But she asked, if these were things were so large, how come everybody missed them? Why did nobody notice it? And the basic answer comes out that this is how economists were behaving. They were looking at inflation and unemployment and seeing it head down. And meantime, something they weren't taking any notice of at all, the level of debt compared to GDP, was rising through the roof. And to those of us who are looking at that, rather than being a black swan event, that was as obvious as the nose on a black swan. We had a debt-driven boom and collapse, and that's what was actually causing all the trouble. And what actually happened was there was a debt bubble driving apparently good economic performance, which burst in 2008. And the fact that we, people like myself and Peter Schiff and and uh, uh, Rob, uh, Robert Schiller and so on, who focus on the level of debt, saw this rising, rising level of debt, thought this can't possibly continue. So in about 2005, late 2005, I went public. I thought this is going to be the biggest catastrophe coming. I have to raise the alarm. And about three years later, the turnaround in debt that I was expecting occurred. Now, according to my conventional neoclassical rivals, this shouldn't have mattered at all. And again, to go back to Ben Bernanke, you find statements of this nature. The debt's not a problem because all the debt is is a transfer of savings from one person to another. So the person who's got less savings can spend less, the person who gets the loan can spend more. In the aggregate, there should be no impact. And again, Ben Bernanke got the job as head of the Federal Reserve largely on the proposition that he was the expert on, the finance, on what caused the Great Depression and how to avoid it. And in fact, at uh, Milton Friedman's birthday, he made a comment about Milton saying, to Milton and Anna, we'd like to say you were right. We did it. It was our fault. That's what caused the Great Depression. Thanks to you, it won't happen again. Well, wow. Great, great birthday present, Ben. He'd actually set it up by following Milton Friedman's advice. But in terms of ignoring good advice, he ignored the debt deflation theory of Great Depressions, largely. There was a, a cop-out where he tried to incorporate some of Fisher's ideas. But he said all it involves is a transfer from debtors to creditors should have no macroeconomic impact. On the other hand, at the other extreme, and I've heard this expressed a couple of times today here, you'll get the populist 
view and a view a lot of non-neoclassical economists have as well, that you can't reap, the, the problem is inevitably built in because you get the debt, but you don't get the interest money to pay the, pay the interest back or the debt back, and that means there has to be a crisis. And the school of thought that I've been a part of makes much the same conclusion in an academic paper. This is a French-Canadian post-Keynesian economist, Louis-Philippe Rochon, saying that the very existence of profits has been a conundrum. The firms can't, according to the theory, they can't re make profits, let alone repay the interest on debt. Well, <clears throat> let's go with the neoclassicals first of all, and what, what is their vision and why do things are all so hunky-dory. Part of it's because of how they see money being created. And so far as they're concerned, banks are just intermediaries. They call themselves financial intermediaries. It implies you have no active role in the economy. And, it, and they, they are seen as being passive amplifiers of what the government does. So the government creates a base money, say a welfare check. The welfare recipient puts that into a bank account. The bank hangs on to a fraction, say 10% of that, lends out the other 90. And by lending out the other 90, the people who become the, get the loan now, of course they've now got credit money and debt created, deposit that money in a bank. Uh, the bank hangs on to the fraction of what's deposited again. And through an iterative process over time, you create the bank, the amount of base money created, that's BM, divided by the reserve requirement. If that was $100 created and a 10% reserve requirement, you'll create $1,000, $1, 100 being the actual base money, 900 being credit money. So banks are just passive amplifiers, uh, mere intermediaries, and all that loans are doing is transferring. Ult ultimately, the level of debt reflects the transfer from savers to borrowers, no macroeconomic impact. That's a conventional argument. The reality is, and this, again this is where the critics are right, banks create credit money out of nothing. They don't need to have reserves first of all. And this was realised by Federal Reserve economists, the good ones, decades ago when they tried to understand why the attempts to control the level of inflation by controlling the rate of growth of the money supply were an abject failure. And this is a Fed economist being quoted by a very good post-Keynesian economist, Basil Moore, the person who originated the concepts of endogenous money in that school of thought, said in the real world, banks extend credit, creating deposits in the process, and look for reserves later, which is just the process Ellen's explained a moment ago. Now again, looking at the empirical data, here I'm quoting a couple of highly conservative neoclassical economists, Nobel Prize winners, it almost guarantees you're a reactionary. Um, they said this, the conventional argument would be that the monetary base was created first and credit money created afterwards, if the conventional theory was correct. Instead, that's the exact opposite of what they found. Credit money is created up to three quarters ahead of the economic cycle and base money moved about a quarter later. So credit money wags the government money tail. The credit money is created from the initial position by the banks and there's no need for that actually to be a problem, of course it almost always is. So I want to take you through a model as to how that happens. And I'm starting from the, what's called the circuit school of economics. Is there a problem with the recording or are you all? I'm wondering, could you slow on just a little? Pardon? Could you speak just a little bit slower? Is there time for that? Okay, I'll try. I'm a very fast talker, so I'll, I'll try to slow down. Yeah, okay, sure, pardon me. Okay. Uh, I'll take you through the European Circuit School. And they have a, a realistic model of money, but they fail to put the whole thing together properly. They ignore the role of the, the central banks. So I'm going to have a model of a pure credit system here. I'm going to look at how pure debt-based money is created in the absence of a central bank. And the way they argue is that they, 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 the verbal model in this particular case starts from the idea of a central bank, but the basic thing they're talking about is a pure credit economy. And they talk about how credit's essentially different to money as well. This is another important distinction. If you have a credit operation, so if I hand an IOU over, which was the analogy that, that uh, Aaron began with in his talk, if you have one person giving another person their own IOU, there's still a financial obligation between them. The only way to cancel that is if money's cha changed over. So money is fundamentally based on credit, but different to the simple notion of a credit note or an IOU. And to be truly monetary, the one point the circuit theory make with thinking in a logical fashion is that it can't be a commodity you're using. So in that fundamental sense, a commodity like gold is not essentially money. Because if you use gold as your money, you're using a particular commodity that anybody can manufacture. If you go digging, if gold's money, 
go and get a gold pan and go to a gold uh, region somewhere, pan yourself some money. Okay, you can make it using other commodities. So that's still a commodity barter-based economy in a fundamental way. To be a monetary, you must be using a token which has no real value. And this is the, one of the logical points the circuit theory starts from. So they rule out the idea of commodity money. They say, yes, there can be commodity money systems. To explain credit, you've got to look at a monetary system using a non-commodity, something you can't manufacture. And normally, that's started as paper money. And finally, that money has to be accepted as, a finally, as, as terminating any obligation between a buyer and a seller. Whereas, of course, I mentioned a while ago, an IOU does not do that. So that has to be feasible. And the final thing is, it shouldn't be possible for the, pe the person or the institution issuing that money to effectively print their own IOUs they can go spend with. There must be some limit on them. They, if they spend money, it must be money they earn in some legitimate sense. So they can't be printing the notes and going shopping with their own notes effectively. So if you have a seller A and a buyer B accepting tokens issued by a bank, you can't have that bank issuing its own tokens and spending it for its own right with, to buy goods produced by A and B. That would be like using IOUs, that would break the whole system down. So putting that all together, Graziani's summary was the only three ways, the only way to, so to meet all those three conditions is to have payments being made by means of promises of a third agent. And that's the essential point the circuit theorists make, that all transactions are three-sided. And that to me was the, that was the, the, the penny dropping that made, gave me the capacity to put together a model I'm going to show you now. All transactions in a capitalist, credit-driven economy are three-sided. There's a buyer, a seller, and a banker. And banks are therefore an essential element of capitalism. You can't leave them out and you can't collapse them into the other firms in the system. And that makes it fundamentally different to barter. So you can't model what's going on here by extending a barter-based model. But that's in fact what neoclassical economists have done. They've taken a model of what's called Valrhasian general equilibrium where there are n commodities being transferred between each other and they talk about relative prices and to try to model money they say well there's an nth plus oneth commodity we designate as the money commodity and that's how you explain exchange and they find that money doesn't matter. Well that's not amazing because they haven't actually got money in their system. They've just gone from n commodities to n plus one. So if you look at a barter economy what's going on in barter is every exchange is two-sided and there are two commodities involved. You have person A giving person B delta units of some commodity X in return for supply units of commodity Y coming back in the opposite direction. So in effect, calling one of those the money commodity is just being semantic and not really analysing money properly. So what you've got in that situation is person A is trying to flog digital cameras to person B who's trying to flog apples and they work out some relative price between the two and that gives you some sort of exchange, but that's not a monetary economy, that's a barter economy. In a sense, it, it suits a, a village in the New Guinea highlands before they develop their own monetary systems. It doesn't suit modern capitalism. So that's what economists teach students as the framework for understanding capitalism. It's no wonder neoclassical economists didn't see this crisis and virtually any other one coming. So a monetary economy is three-sided with a single commodity being sold and the exchanges are financial. So you have the basic idea of person A giving person B something else in return for person B directing a bank to make a transfer from B's account to A's account. So in a sense there's an eternal triangle in, in capitalism. Here's A who's now flogging a digital camera to B and what B actually does is tell bank Z to make a transfer from B's account across to A's account of Psi dollars. So that's all exchanges are three-sided and that builds all the way up. You can take this to modelling, uh, having a fiat money system there as well and having transactions between bank A and bank B being intermediated by a, 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 a banker's bank, a reserve bank and so on. So that's the basic position to start looking from. And therefore you can't collapse the banks into the other firms. You must treat them separately and they function as clearing houses and so on. So all that's, I'm going over that fairly quickly because I want to get to the model itself. This is background and I'll make these slides available of course through Aaron's uh, conference. Now how does that actually work? That's the general background, the verbal, how does it actually function? 
So I'm going to take you through a model now of a pure credit economy. And that's going to be one of a bank which issues its own notes. Now, your, your state was one of the many states that had a system like that in the 19th century of free banking. And the fundamental idea was that banks were able to issue notes like these, and they circulated in the community as money. And the basic idea was that the elite of the society in some part of the uh, continental United States would form a bank. The notes would notionally be backed by their own wealth. They'd print those notes, lend them out to local businesses, and it would then all circulate. So how would it work? Well, I'm going to build a model with five stylized accounts now. I'm going to have a vault where the bank, where the bank first of all puts those newly printed notes. A safe which the bank uses for spending and where the interest payments go in and out of. So the bank produces in the vault, but it can only spend from the safe. A loans account. Now this is a ledger. This is not a physical repository of money. It's a book where you record how much is owed, what's been charged, and what's been paid off, what's been charged. Then I'm going to have two deposit accounts for the classes and society. A firm's account for the deposits of the firms or capitalists. I lump them together as one. And workers, a deposit account for households or workers. So those are my five accounts. And I'll start with them, say, say $1 million worth of notes being put into the vault and see what happens next. $1 million or $100 million. Okay, so, so let's say there's $1 million in the vault. All other accounts are zero. So I'm starting from here. And look at the table down the bottom now. I'll take you through that line by line as I build it up. So the first thing is bank loans transfer notes from the vault across to the firms. So that's a transfer of money going on. The bank then records that those loans have occurred in the loans ledger. So whatever amount's been transferred, the bank makes an identical entry, and it's now a bookkeeping entry, in the list of the loans that are outstanding. The bank then charges interest on those loans, and that's again another bookkeeping entry. It records, you know, we charge 5% per annum, you owe us so much right now, I'm compounding that at a rate of 5% per annum. The firm then pays interest on that, uh, on that loan, and that means a transfer from the firm's account across to the safe. And since that money's been transferred, the bank has to also record that the payments occurred. So it makes another deduction now from the ledger, from the loan ledger. And then finally, the bank will pay deposit interest across to the firm. So there's a transfer, again, of physical money now from the safe across to the firm's account. Now, that's just stating it as a table, but an uh, English programmer has put this together for me as a software package. So that's the table I've just taken you through a moment ago, and I'm now going to simulate that. So you now see these repositories here. Wherever you see what looks like a dam, that's a repository for the money. Where you see a pump, that's a flow of money passing through the system. And if I start playing this and simulating it step by step, then you're seeing what's happening. The money's coming out of the vault, flowing into the firm's account, and the, the amount that's flowed in is being recorded over here in the, deposit, in the loan ledger. Notice that there are dotted lines joining across from the fl flow to flow to show this is actually a recording entry. It's not actually a physical transfer of money. So the physical transfers are taking place here. It's all going into the firm's account right now, but of course they're paying interest, so they pay money interest across to the safe, the safe is paying deposit interest back to them, but you can see which one is bigger. And if you keep on doing it, let's speed things up a bit, then over time the money first of all flows into the firm's account, and then the interest payments transfer that money across to the safe, and ultimately all the money in the system ends up in the safe. If I kept it going, of course, the, bank, the, uh, the firms would have negative amounts inside there. So that's the basic dynamic. That's the starting point of the whole thing. But of course, I haven't tied the whole system together yet because I haven't actually taken into account that the banks, the, the firms use that money to hire workers in factories, whose existence I'm taking for granted right now. I'll extend that later and show you how this whole thing ties together. Now, the program I call QED, A, because it's a nice, cute name, B, because it commemorates the person I think who should have been the founder of economics, a guy called Francois Conet, part of the uh, physiocratic school in France, where I regard was a far better thinker about how the economy actually functions than Adam Smith. And I've embedded the program inside 
the uh, PowerPoint slide there, so you can download it yourself, expand it to a hard disk, and run it on your own computer. And uh, it only runs in, in Windows, by the way, at the moment. Now, what I'm, yeah, pardon me, but I didn't write the code, so. You know, I've mocked this up in simulation software, packaged like Psychos and so on. This is just a more glamorous way of doing it. Now, I'm going to close the system by bringing in workers and factories consumption. So what I'm adding in here now is that the firms pay wages to workers. So there's a transfer now of money, physical money, from the firm's account, which you can see here, across to the workers' account as wages. The bank then pays interest to the workers as well. So there's a transfer again of money from the safe across to the workers' wages account. And then workers and bankers consume. So they transfer money from their accounts across to the firm's accounts. And at that end result, that is a simple system that most people think can't work, but I'm going to show you it's sustainable. The firms will make profits, workers earn wages, banks earn interest, the whole thing ties together. But according to a lot of people, that's not even possible. And the argument people make is that interest can't be repaid. That's a common belief. I've heard it expressed here several times today. Interest can't be repaid because loans are less than the loans plus interest, and therefore firms can't repay the debt, and you can't make monetary profits. Again, that same quote from Louis-Philippe Rochon. That's wrong because it's confusing a stock, which is the size of the initial loan in dollars, with a flow, which is what profits and interest and wages are, which is dollars per year. Okay. It's a simple stock flow confusion, but it's, it's so common in economics. In fact, an engineer who came across to economics and did a lot of original thought, a man called Mikhail Kolesky, who's regarded by many post-Keynesians as a more important founder of the technical sides of non-orthodox post-Keynesian economics than even Keynes. He once uh, bumped into an economist when crossing uh, the fields of Cambridge University in England and said that, I finally worked out what economics is. It's the science of confusing stocks with flows. <laughs> well, it's a science that's still unfortunately alive and well. So I've tried to find ways to get around that confusion and I'll show you that complete model now with a constant money stock and see what happens with it. It's a larger model so the graphics take up a bit more time. Let's just move things around a bit. So now I've got the workers getting wages as well. I've, got, I've still got my, all the money coming out of the, uh, out of the um, vault and not, uh, not going back into again by debt repayment. I'll bring that in shortly. But if I play that system, ultimately everything except the vault stabilises. You'll see all those counts which were going to, to negative positions beforehand, flat line. And if you see the rates of flow that are passing through there, which are showing the total flows over time, if I click this box here and say show the rates of flow, you show them all settling down. So over the time, if you look at this, workers get wages of about $333 per year out of a stock of money of $100. And the reason being the money's turning over three to four times per annum. Okay? And that generates both the wages of the workers, the profits of the firms, and it enables the firms to easily pay the interest bill, which in this case is $5 in gross terms. And you can run that model yourself and take a look at it. So the accounts are stable, if all the accounts stabilise, which they do do. When I add in ultimately the, the, uh, the vault, uh, money's loans repaid back into the vault, they then circulate from the vault as well. So the whole thing stabilises quite easily. And to show you why it works and why it's not a difficult thing, all the dynamics are in the final eight rows of the table here. And what you do to work out what's happening in the system is add up the entries in those columns, but you add them up symbolically. They're all rates of flow over time. They're not actually numerical values. And those accounts will stabilise if the, slums, the sums in each of the flows uh, in the columns sums to zero. So I'm taking a look at the last eight rows now, which leave out what's happening to the vault. And you'll find that the loans account will stabilise if the interest charged on the loans is equal to the interest paid. That's pretty straightforward. The firm's account will stabilise if the interest on loans, which they have to pay out, plus the wages which they're also paying out, are equal to the deposit interest they get back in from the bank, plus consumption by workers and bankers. The safe will stabilise if the deposit interest that's being paid out, plus workers' consumption, equals the interest on loans. 
and workers' accounts will stabilise if their consumption equals their wages plus deposit interest. Those are not onerous conditions. It's fairly straightforward. And the vault will also stabilise if loan repayment equals the rate of new loans, which I bring in in a larger model where the, vault, the firm then pays some of the loan back and the bank then re-lends from that uh, money that's been paid back into the vault because the vault doesn't go to zero. So you get a sustainable system and the bank assets are now equal to the notes that are in the vault plus the loans to the firms. So again, you can simulate that whole system there. And when I run the model with the ex example parameters I've got embedded in that uh, zip file, wages work out to being a bit more than $310 per annum or $1 million per annum. Net interest, 3.72 million. Profit, 217 million. So I've got quite a high rate of circulation and all three classes make money. It's a sustainable economic system. Now, the next step is that's, just, that's a system with a set amount of money in it. How do we get to a growing economy? Well, in the 19th century, you simply printed more notes, whacked them in the vault and lent from the vault. In the 20th century, much easier still, you simply create a new loan by loaning out new money and record that you've done so in the ledger. A simple double entry bookkeeping operation is what creates both new money and new loans and lets the system expand. So the 19th century, you whack more money in the vault and it'll grow over time. In the 20th century, you simultaneously issue a new loan and a new deposit. And the system will also grow sustainably over time. It doesn't have to break down. So it's not inherently unstable. Banks can pay the interest and make a profit. Debt can remain low and constant relative to GDP. When I run the simulation over a long period of time, I get a debt to GDP ratio of about 25%. And rising debt is also a necessity in a growing economy. It's not bad to have debt per se. And there's, I'll give you two arguments on this point from non-orthodox, non-neoclassical economists, the first being Hyman Minsky. And he points out that if you're going to have growing inco in income over time, then aggregate demand has to be growing all the time. And he said for that to be growing, it has to somehow be larger than aggregate supply at all times. And for that to happen, some parts of society have to be issuing, funding part of their expenditure by issuing debt. Now, I know that one's a bit difficult for people to get their heads around. I find this one makes a bit more sense to most people. This is a vision from Schumpeter, who gave us the idea of evolutionary economics. And Schumpeter said that growing debt adds to demand beyond that generated by simply selling goods and services. And the proposition is quite simple. It relates to what used to be a fundamental part of the American economy, the entrepreneur. Now you've got the financial engineer, a very different uh, beast. But a growing, in a growing economy, you need entrepreneurial activity to bring about new processes and new products. And entrepreneurs are people who have a good idea but don't necessarily have any money. Now if they're going to turn the idea into money, they need purchasing power before they have goods to sell. And they get that purchasing power from a bank. And in that sense, Sean Pater's vision of a bank was like venture capitalists allegedly are today. So entrepreneurial demand is fi financed not by the circular flow of commodities, not by selling what they've already got, but by selling what they don't have, and they do that by getting a loan. And therefore, total demand in the economy is the sum of what you get out of turnover, GDP, but also what you get out of creating new debt. And it's an essential part of an expanding entrepreneurial economy. Of course, that's the good side of it. The bad side is that that debt and the fact that banks make money out of debt gives you a tendency for instability because again, this is very easy to demonstrate and I built another model in QED that shows this. Bank income will rise if three things happen. If they issue new money more rapidly, if debt is repaid more slowly and it's also, as I show in another stage, if they, if they circulate, more, circulate the existing stock more rapidly. So those three reasons mean that banks will have a tendency always to create more money, to circulate what they've currently got more rapidly, and to, and to uh, encourage you to pay loans down more slowly. Okay? If that, those three things happen, bank income will rise. And again, I've done a simulation which is embedded in the zip file to show you that. So banks have got an inherent bias towards creating debt. And if you're going to stop that inherent bias being expressed, it comes down to the borrowers. Because trying to stop the banks trying to lend money is a bit like being King Canute and trying to stop the tides coming in. 
not going to happen. Okay? You've, got a, you've got a basis system that copes with the fact that tides come in. Well, borrowers will control that, and if borrowers were borrowing solely on the basis of their income, then even though they can make big mistakes in that, particularly when capitalists get very euphoric about the potential for making money out of the next big thing, the last time it was the internet, um, they can get exaggerated. But fundamentally, if, in, if, in, if the level you borrow is limited to your income, or some comparison to your income sensibly estimated, then there's going to be a limit on how much lending banks can actually encourage us to take on. So the solution, inverted commas, that banks use is to drag us into Ponzi schemes. Fundamentally, I see the merchant banking system in America, the shadow banking system, as a disguised version of a Ponzi scheme. Because potential borrowers are taking on debt there, not to finance consumption or not to finance genuine investment or entrepreneurial activity, but because they expect asset prices to rise. Therefore, they borrow money to buy the asset, and duh, that drives up the price of the asset. Okay. You then get a positive feedback loop between the two, which entices other people into the market. You've got a Ponzi scheme, and banks are going to take over the system. And that's fundamentally what drives this form of instability. The positive feedback between the level of debt and rising asset prices sucks you into more debt, and the only people who win out of this ultimately, until it all collapses, of course, are the banks, the real estate agents, and the brokers. They're the ones who actually make the money. The scheme works until it fails. It will always fail because ultimately that rising debt level is rising faster than GDP. It therefore means you get a servicing cost that rises faster than income, and at some point you can't service the debt and the economy collapses. Because to continue working, it'll only continue working if debt continues accelerating. And I'll show you that shortly. So that's the real reason why debt is so important and why banks are dangerous, not because what they do is inherently bad, but because there's an inherent temptation to drag us into Ponzi behaviour, which they've universally succumbed to over time. And of course, when they do, they take over, Wall Street takes over Washington, and they then lobby and argue that they're absolutely essential for the economy and you can't get rid of the bastards until about five years have gone by when you're willing to put them in jail rather than uh, uh, put them in castles. Now, the conventional theory, as I said, says that de debt has minor effects. It says that it just redistributes spending power that already exists. Uh, as I've shown you in the argument so far, in a realistic world within, where money is actually created endogenously, increasing debt expands aggregate demand. So your aggregate demand is not just GDP, it's GDP plus the change in debt. You've got to include the change in debt to work out your aggregate spending power. And that applies to you individually and it does aggregate to the national level as well. So what you spend, of course, you spend not just on goods, you spend on existing assets as well. So you've got to both throw together your income plus your change in debt and you have to throw together commodity markets plus asset markets because they're a bit like omelettes, they're totally scrambled. You can't leave them out. But neoclassical theory, by, by separating them, has got a, you know, a theory of a, of a egg, the egg that has white and no yolk. Now, as the larger the level of debt gets to be, that change in debt can become very volatile, and that can dominate economic performance, which, of course, is what we've seen happening shortly. So I want to show you the scale of the debt we've got ourselves into. Now, going back to 1920, with data from the US Census plus the US flow of funds, you can see there have been two really big debt bubbles in the last century, and we're living in the biggest of them. I mean biggest, I've used the wrong term there. I think this is the biggest debt bubble in human history, not just in the last 100 years. Now, the, the dotted line going across the screen there is the level of debt that America was in when the Great Depression began back in 1930. Fast forward to now and you find you crack that ratio of debt to GDP sometime in the late 1990s, and you are now at a level of debt that is 1.7 times what it was when the Great Depression began, which is one of the many reasons why the only time you can compare this to is the Great Depression. Now, I want to indicate the role that changing debt levels had in causing demand back in the boom of the Roaring Twenties and the collapse of the 1930s, and give you an idea of just how much this change in debt factor drove the economy. It was actually the explanation for the Great Depression, completely missed by Ben Bernanke, Okay? He didn't even look at the role of private debt in causing the Great Depression. 
but you can look at it quite easily here. So the blue line is the GDP, America's GDP back in 1920 to 1940, and the red line is the level of debt. So I've got the GDP and the level of debt there. The next slide takes a look at the change in debt and adds that to GDP to work out what aggregate demand was. So now I'm looking at GDP plus the change in debt. So the, the red line is GDP alone, the blue line is GDP plus change in debt. Now you can see that in the 1920s, the change in debt was adding to demand. You had this rising level of demand, therefore rising, rising, uh, rising debt, therefore rising demand. But then you had the plunge starting with the Great, Depre starting the Great Depression, where rather than adding to demand, the change in debt was subtracting from aggregate demand. That's what really gave you the Great Depression. And I can indicate that by correlating those two facts, that the, cha the uh, aggregate demand and uh, to unemployment, and seeing what the correlation is like. Now, Ben Bernanke looked only at the correlation of M1 to unemployment um, and got a very low correlation just for the period of the Great Depression, not low, but 4.4. This is looking at a correlation of unemployment and the change in the debt finance change in demand across both the boom of the roaring 20s and the, uh, <coughs> pardon me, the down to the Great Depression. Can you get me a glass of water, please? Thank you. And you can see enormous correlation there. When debt goes up, unemployment goes down. It's a negative correlation. And the correlation over that whole time period from 1922, thank you, through to 1940, is minus 0.93, nine, almost 0.94. You can only get to minus one. That shows the, the scale of, of the impact of change of debt on aggregate demand. What about hap what's happening now? Well, here's a similar chart looking at the ab absolute level of debt and the absolute uh, rate of G GDP. And you can see from that chart straight alone, you're in deeper doo-doo now than you were in the 1930s. Now let's take a look at the change in debt and get that aggregate demand effect from 1990, which of course was the beginning of a slump, through 1993 to 2000, a boom, back into a slump again, back into a boom again. This is GDP plus the change in debt. And again, you can see the same impact. You've now gone to the stage where change in debt is actually subtracting from demand. And that hasn't happened since the 1930s. And what you've got happening is deleveraging, driving you into a depression. <clears throat> so now I'm looking at aggregate demand, including the red line is aggregate demand from the private sector alone. The black line adds in the government spending contribution. Even so, you've got the change in debt subtracting from aggregate demand. And that's where your crisis came from. It began in 2008 when you went from peak debt to starting to delever. But notice there's been a recent turnaround, which is one reason why your unemployment rate has stabilised recently. Looking at the correlation with unemployment, I'm now going back to 1975. So I'm going through all sorts of economic circumstances and I get a correlation which is pretty marvellous over that period of time, minus 0.7. Again, a very high correlation for two factors that neoclassical economists would tell you have no relationship to each other at all. Which unemployment is that? Shadow stats or the official unemployment? This is official unemployment, not, not shadow stats. It's worse for shadow stats, of course. Now again, notice there's been a turnaround. Uh, again, this is an important little point to establish. You've had a decline in your unemployment rate, or rather a stabilisation of it. You've also had that turnaround in debt. So the fact that you're stabilising doesn't turn the argument around. You're finding, I'm still finding, even in the recovery phase, what appears to be a recovery, the debt argument still explains what's going on. And what's going on there is that since aggregate demand is the sum of GDP plus the change in debt, then the change in aggregate demand is the sum of the change in GDP plus the acceleration of debt. Okay, that's the real trick that's occurring right now. So changes in aggregate demand and therefore changes in employment rate are going to be correlated not with the change in debt, but acceleration or deceleration, the change in the change, a second order effect, <coughs> second differential. Now, I was a bit of a, I'm not often uh, backward in taking a step forward, but I was a bit of a coward here. I didn't actually check these stats because I didn't, I thought I was pushing my luck to find the correlation. I thought it would be so tough to find it in economic data that wouldn't actually be there apparently in the data, even though it really was. And uh, therefore, three other economists beat me to it and they called it the credit impulse. 
and I'm going to show you the, the uh, correlation now. So if I look now at the change in the change in debt as a prevention of GDP and correlate that with the change in employment and see what comes up, you show that the, this is the driver of the economy, not just when you've got a debt dominated economy, which is the, the bad thing now, but even back in the days when you used to borrow money for good reasons, like entrepreneurial activity back in the 50s and 60s. Because now I'm looking at the correlation of the change in employment with the acceleration or deceleration of debt over 55 years. And you can see, A, that it's a powerful correlation, and B, you've never been here before, except during the Great Depression. So that is remarkably high correlation to get for a, a rate of change correlated with the rate of rate of change in economic data. I didn't expect it. I wish I had the courage uh, <laughs> to go and get it. I've got to tap my hat to somebody else. That's not a bad thing to do in economics occasionally. You can see when the crisis began as well. That's when the acceleration in debt turned to deceleration back in 2008, and you, you, you hit the brakes like you'd never hit them before. And you've only stalled the crisis by taking your feet off the brakes to some extent. So you're falling towards the ground more slowly. It feels better. You're still going to break your neck, but it feels better. So credit drives the economy, and this is actually another little case to establish that. I'm just showing you, when I'm showing a correlation, I'm not showing causation, but part of establishing causation is to say, well, what moves before what? And here I'm showing that the acceleration in debt precedes changes in both employment and GDP by about three months. So it's a very, very close linkage, but the change in credit, or the change in the change in credit, is what drives both employment and GDP. Now, credit doesn't have to cause a crash. It doesn't have to drive you over the cliff, but it always does. And as I mentioned, the main reason of that temptation of Ponzi finance. So to put this all together, we need a model of economics that includes Ponzi finance. And that was built by Hyman Minsky, but I want to give you a bit of background of where Minsky came from. And this is tying together a, a range of economic literature that economists should be looking at. They should throw all the Milton Friedman stuff and a lot of the Volrazian stuff out the window. This is where they should be starting. The economy is inherently cyclical and there's nothing critical about capitalism to say it's cyclical. If I said anybody in this room was completely stable, I'd be saying you're dead. <laughs> okay? You've all got cycles, circadian rhythms, etc., etc. It's a natural thing of any living system to be cyclical. So saying a system cyclical is not being critical. And the best person for the arguments about the inherent cyclicality was Schumpeter with ways of innovation and destruction and why they tend to come in pulses rather than smoothly over time. For looking at the social factors that give you cycles in capitalism, Marx was the best, though not with his theory of final crisis, that was wrong, but the argument about struggles over the distribution of income and Richard Goodwin put the work together mathematically and I've used that as a basis for my work since then. And in modern times, we've learned a lot more about the nature of truly living cyclical systems in what we now call complexity theory. And people like uh, Lorenz, Mandelbrot, and Priagene are essential there. So there's a lot of rich science we can draw on about how complex aperiodic cycles evolve in evolutionary systems like the economy itself is. It's inherently monetary. So the work of Basil Moore and Augusto Graziani is essential there. And it's inherently inflected by uncertainty. Neoclassical economists have modelled the economy by presum presuming we all have the foresight of Nostradamus. <laughs> That's what they call rational behaviour. I'm not joking. What those guys have done to the, to the uh, Eng English language, you know there's a Nobel Prize for economics, which actually is not a Nobel Prize. It was invented by the Swedish Central Bank and they asked to use the name back in 1953. But there is a Nobel Prize for literature. And on that basis, I reckon they should actually assassinate all the economists who won the Nobel Prize, because they've, they've tortured the English language. So the best person for uncertainty is Keynes, and it's not Keynes of ISLM modelling. What's called ISLM uh, is a technical way of modelling the macroeconomy derived from a guy called John Hicks, who himself abandoned it in 1979 on the basis that it couldn't handle uncertainty. And 30 years later, economists are still using it, neoclassical economists. Now, given the nature of capital assets and the fact, all those facts above, it's the desire that banks have to create debt that leads to financial crises. And the person who put this together best 
is Hyman Minsky, who was affected by all the above. 